Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil our may. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church, and we need your power in us. We see your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. We refuse to waste our are here in God's house, and that's our prayer, is that God would build his kingdom through us, and uh, what a joy it is to be used by him every day as we look out. We've been talking about joy and how to have joy and how to have love for others because he loved us first, and so we're going to continue that series today, and we're excited that you guys are here. Looking forward to a great day with you guys. My name is Rob. I'm the worship pastor here at Lifehouse. If this is your very first time to Lifehouse, man, thank you guys for coming, especially in that, is it still raining out there? Oh, poor you guys. But yeah, 
Yeah, so, so we're excited that you've come today. And um, if you're a guest, if this is your very first time, again, we thank you for coming. We welcome you. Ushers are coming forward right now. We have a card for you. What we want you to do is fill that card out. And you can just put the information that you want to put on there, all right? If there's any questions about the church, maybe you have a prayer request that you'd like a pastor to pray over for you. Um, that's what that card is there for. So fill that card out. You can drop it in the offering basket that will probably go by in a couple minutes from now. Or you can hang on to it, bring it back to the connect table after the service. We have a free gift for you guys, so don't leave without your free gift, all right? And we want to make sure that you feel welcome and, uh, and honored here. We're, we're glad you're here, all right? Church, would you agree? Yeah, so we're glad you're here. If this is your very first time to LifeHouse, would you mind raising your hands up real high until you get one of these cards? That's all we're going to ask you to do today. Raise them up real high. And uh, church, while they're giving out those cards, again, let's welcome these guys for the first time. Awesome. Why don't you find somebody around you that matches your outfit and uh, tell them how good they look. But welcome each other to church. We're glad you're here.
Sereka and me and my family are partners here and we are going to continue oh, I'm sorry you can sit down I apologize it's that kind of stuff that I just forget and get into my get into my thing here <laughs> so we're partners here and we are uh, going to continue our worship this morning as we uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper through communion uh, logistically before we get started uh, just a reminder or for those that are new we're gonna have eight stations we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have four up front and four in the back and uh, just stay to the right both ways. You're going to tear a piece of the bread, dip it in the juice, and then head back to your seats uh, to the right. So in all, in the, to my far right, we're going to have a, uh, a gluten-free option as well. So what would it look like if we had constant communion with God? What if we really prayed without ceasing? Where every decision was guided because we were so in tune with the Spirit. We have the opportunity to sit here this morning as an expression of thankfulness and remembrance to the sacrifice that Jesus made in order for us to experience that communion with God. See, Jesus is the bridge between us and the Father. So we come here in a worshipful manner, not only to remember, but also to reconnect and to refresh that relationship. But see, the one thing we wanna emphasize here is we never want this to be a one-time thing. If we seek that connection with God, it has to be in that constant state that lasts beyond this. And as we started uh, this year, the church-wide Bible reading uh, plan that we've been doing, one thing that stood out to me in the Old Testament as we read through Genesis was the numerous examples of men who walked with God. References to Enoch and Noah and Abraham walking with God in a constant state. And this involves more than just using God to answer uh, instant prayers or using them like a genie, but our communion with God should never be half-hearted just for a few moments in the morning. It should be in that constant state that we talk about. But the communion with God is possible through the blood of Jesus Christ. And this puts us back to the point where we are here today to remember the sacrifice. See, there was a design. God had a plan for bringing us back into communion with him. That was at the costly expense of his son. Isaiah 53, four through six says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, our Heavenly Father loves us, and we were created for his glory. So glorifying him is something that we don't do just during communion or after, but communing with him all the time, we are constantly glorifying him. Yes, communion with God is something that we do during this time, but let's not forsake this as we move forward. 
And what that does is it opens up what he has for us, his love and mercy and righteousness. And plus the fact that he's our refuge and strong tower. And wants to t he, he, his desire is to take those burdens from us. He, he's right there with us wanting to take those burdens. And I'm reminded of a, of a story with my, with, my, uh, with my second son, Carter, um, who's 12 now. But when he was... When the boys were younger, we would go to Glasgow Park. We would go to the, route, the on, up on Route 40 and, and Bear, and they had the big hill there. They have a big hill that the boys would love to climb up, and they would take rocks with them, and they would throw the rocks down the hill, making sure there was nobody on the other side, of course. But I remember him being young, two years old, and struggling to make his way up the hill and trying to carry all these big rocks, all these burdens that he couldn't get up the hill, and he would fall, and I would be right there beside him saying, I can, I can pick these rocks up for you. I can take these for you. But he never wanted to. He wanted to take them up and struggle the whole way up. And that's, what it, that's, that's how God is for us. When we aren't in communion with him, it takes away from the joy and that, and that, that freedom that he wants to give us of taking that, that burden from us. So let's not sit here routinely and go through the motions of communion. I want us to remember the connection between God's love for us, making a way to send his son to die for us so that we can be reconciled back to God. 1 Corinthians 11 23 through 26 says, For I received from the Lord what I have also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So use this time to remember the sacrifice and to reconnect, to refresh, and get our hearts right. And for those that aren't believers and haven't put their trust in Jesus Christ yet, Jesus is clear in his word that this is for believers. This is a time for believers to remember. But our prayer is that we want you to be part of that joy and in in to celebrate in this communion at some point. So hopefully even maybe today during the sermon, after the sermon or, or beyond, there is a time that you can also join in with us. But for now, this is the time of communion to be set aside for believers. So let's not only remember the blood shed for you and me, but also commit this time past this to constantly walk with, walk with God and celebrate that communion with him beyond for him to, so we can see those, that joy that he has for us and to take away those burdens to get that freedom. So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we just, we love you, Lord. We're just so humbled as we sit here and we, and we celebrate and remember the sacrifice of your son, of you sending your son to die for us, Lord. And Lord, we pray that this does not stop here, that we take this beyond and we continue our communion with you, Lord, each and every day, knowing that you're right beside us and that you desire each and every one of us, Lord. So our prayer is that we will have that passion and that fervor to not to not make this a, a one-time event or come to you in, in times of crisis, but Lord, that, that you are a part of us, that we are just filled with the Spirit and every decision that we make, every step that we take, Lord, that it is, it is all you. And we thank you once again for this time. We pray that you would just uh, search our hearts, Lord, help us to, to come clean of our hearts and to be ready uh, to celebrate and to remember during the Lord's Supper. And we thank you and we love you for all you do and all you continue to do. In your wonderful son's name we pray. Amen. We didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. Sin was great, your love was greater And what could separate us now What a wonderful name it is Sing it compares to this what a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus what a wonderful name it is 
death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. you silenced the boast of sin and grave. Heavens are rolling, praise of your glory. you made for us but we don't deserve it Lord we come to you as your children and ask for you to continue your work Lord in us may you be glorified in all that we do Lord and we do or say not just here but at home at work on the road Lord help us to be a light in this dark world that we live in God we praise you we thank you for your gift Lord, I thank you that one day we'll get to see you face to face. God, what, a, what an awesome day that's going to be. To see you and to worship you in a way that we have no earthly idea. It's going to be amazing. So God, we thank you that you came to give life. For those of you, those of us who receive your gift, Lord, bless us, Lord, as, as we continue each day working, serving you and finding our, our lost friends, our lost family members and bringing them to you. God, help us to always stay on mission. Lord, we praise your holy name. There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome There's a day that's drawing near When this darkness 
darkness breaks to light And the shadows disappear And my faith shall be my eyes Jesus has overcome And the grave is over about that day that we go and we rise those of us who have made that decision to follow Christ and uh, what an awesome time it's going to be for us to just offer ourselves man and uh, but until then here on earth we're called to worship we're to worship through living worship through giving and uh, right now is at the time of our service where we worship through giving and there's a number of ways we can give here at Lifehouse Church you can text to give, you can give online, you can go to the Lifehouse app, or you can do it the old-fashioned way and drop it in the basket that's going to go by in a little bit. But um, our desire here at Lifehouse is that we would not only give ourselves, but we would give everything, and that includes finances. I know some of you may be jaded with that, because there are crooks out there. Even Paul talked about it. 2,000 years ago, there were crooks out there. But here at Lifehouse Church, we do our best to be above and beyond uh, we have a, an outside financial firm that looks at the books constantly, and uh, we kind of feel that that's better for us to, to be held accountable with a financial team, awesome, godly uh, men and women who, who look at the books and make sure that we do what we're going to say we're going to do. I don't know if you knew this, but last year alone, we were able to give over $200,000 outside of Lifehouse Church, and that's what it's all about, is to give, give, give. I want to um, just share with you real quick, Matthew 16, 19 through 24, and uh, it says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth 
and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And this is the the most important part of this passage. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the question we need to ask ourselves this morning is where is our heart? Where are our finances? Do they line up with what we say as being followers of Christ? Are we investing into eternity instead of 70, 80, maybe 90 plus years if if we're blessed. Where are we laying up our treasures? Let's pray. Father, we pray for this offering where we lift up this opportunity to give and to worship. Lord, would you bless each giver? Lord, would you bless each gift? Lord, would you multiply it? Lord, help us, direct us, continue to guide this church in what you would have us do with the finances that already belong to you. Lord, we thank you for avenues and ways that we can help others, help missionaries, help those who are on the field, Lord, overseas in third world countries. We pray that these monies right here would be an investment and last for eternity. Lord, again, I pray for hearts this morning. Help our heart to be where our mouth is. Lord, help our gifts, help our treasure, help our bank account to reflect that. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity to give. In Jesus' name, amen. There's my microphone. (laughs) Phew. What a blessing it is to gather, amen, to assemble, to come together to worship God who is worthy, who alone is worthy. I invite you to turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And you'll see as you turn there when you find that place, again, not to be confused with the Gospel of John in the beginning of the New Testament, but 1 John towards the end. You'll see 1 John chapter 5 brings us towards the end of our verse-by-verse journey through this incredible work. Just to remind you or inform of those of you who are guests or visiting today, we've called this series through this book of 1 John the Joy Series. Because ultimately, joy was John's hope for those he was writing this work to. Joy in Jesus. Joy regardless of one's circumstances or situation. John the Apostle wrote this work later in his life. He was a leader at this time. People truly respected him and his faith, his faithfulness. And he wrote this work specifically to believers whom he loved. He had a relationship with them. He wrote to people who claimed to have saving faith in Jesus Christ. But believers who were also struggling in their faith. And as such, joy was not theirs. Now just as a matter of comparison, because John who wrote the book of 1 John also wrote the Gospel of John, and in that Gospel he clearly stated his purpose for writing that Gospel. He's, he's said, basically summarized, paraphrased, he said, my hope is that you would read this work and that you would believe and then receive. That you would believe in Jesus and that you would receive the life that is available in him. John 20, 31, he says, all these things are written. Each of these specific testimonies about Jesus Christ, his miracles, about what he said, what he did, all these things, there was a lot more things. He even acknowledged that. He said, were every one of the things, all these things written, I suppose even the world could not contain the books that would be written if everything was written. But he said, all these things in this gospel were written so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you would have life in his name. All these things. So again, just as a comparison, John wrote his gospel in hopes that people would believe and thereby receive life. He wrote the work of First John to those who did believe. However, for various reasons, the believers he was writing to in First John were struggling with the receive part, the life part. That life promised was lacking for those believers in general. They were not thriving in Jesus, alive in Jesus. Their faith was faltering. They were spiritually weak, and they did not have joy. And so that reality is basically what he addresses in 1 John throughout the work. 
He wanted to encourage them. He wanted to explain things to them so that they would live as believers as they were meant to live, so that they would receive and experience what God offered and offers to everyone who believes, so that they would have what God gave them, namely, but not limited to life. It's like God gave them a gift, wrapped it up, put their name on it, put it right under the Christmas tree, right up front so they could see it. But just like it did for us, Christmas for them came and went. But that gift, their gift remained wrapped up and unopened, not hidden. It was front and center. It was clearly their gift. Their name was on it, but it was still sitting under the tree where they left it at this point collecting dust simply waiting to be unwrapped and opened by them. And John, who writes this gospel, he'd been given the same gift so long before and opened that gift long before and knowing they'd love what God gave them, knowing that they needed what God gave them more than they even realized he had a heart for them to open it up and simply receive what they as believers had, what God gave them, eternal life. At the end of the day, when you've got that, you've got joy. And a whole lot more, eternal life. But understand and hear me this morning, believers. That life does not begin when we die. It begins when we believe. Let me say that again. Hear me. Eternal life The life that God promises, the life that we have as believers does not begin when we die. It begins when we believe. It is ours when we believe. The Greek word used in the New Testament, throughout the New Testament, for eternal, when it's paired up with life, it carries with it the idea of quality in addition to quantity. So it doesn't merely mean an extension, so to speak, but it also points to experience and expression. It's the same idea that Jesus expresses in John 10, 10, when he said, I've come, I'm here, God sent me, that you might have life, but not just life, that you might have it more abundantly. That kind of life. So understand eternal life is something believers are to experience now, here and now. We don't have to wait. Eternal life and its experience and expression starts the moment we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said in John 3, 36, Jesus said, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. He did not say will have eternal life. He didn't say might have eternal life. He didn't say may someday have, hopefully have eternal life. Jesus, who always tells us the truth, said whoever believes has eternal life. He also said in John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me, he or has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Paul, along this line and with the same truth, says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, believers, how about it? Got life? If so, you've got joy, too. Got eternal life? Have you received what God gave you when you believed? Or does that gift, the free gift of God, your gift in Christ Jesus, our Lord, remain forgotten, overlooked, wrapped up under the tree, collecting collecting dust? How long will you leave it there? For many of the believers John was writing to in 1 John, this life, eternal life, was their possession, but it was not their experience. And John, as someone who loved them so much, was not okay with that reality, and so he wrote 1 John. And just so you know, as I reflect on and assess many believers today, my brothers and sisters in Christ, whom I love, I would say the same. So many of us possess eternal life, but that is not our experience And as someone who loves you, I want you to know I'm not okay with that. There are a lot of things that we are to wait upon the Lord for. 
But this is not one of them. Eternal life is not one of those things. In the specific passage before us today, 1 John 5, 1 through 12, we will see what I have summarized as three things. The evidence, the testimonies, and the verdict. The evidence, the testimonies, and the verdict, all regarding this free gift of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray as we prepare to read together. Father God, I look to you. I'm your servant. By grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Lord, I pray that you would do this morning what only you can do. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. John writes, starting in verse 1, everyone, and just so you know, everyone means everyone, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we obey his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony, verse 11. This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I'm going to repeat verses 11 and 12. This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. May God bless the reading of his holy word. So how about it, believer? Got life. Do you have life? And if not, why not? Got Jesus? Do you have Jesus? If not, it is my earnest prayer that you would not delay and that you would call upon his name today. You can have Jesus. You, no matter where you've been and what you've done, you can have Jesus life. Those getting baptized this afternoon that are a part of our congregation, praise God, 21 men, women, and children are declaring that they have Jesus. By the grace of God, I stand before you now and I testify, I declare to you that I have Jesus. Jesus is mine. This is my story. This is my song. And it's only by the grace of God. And so I will praise him. All the day long. John went on to say in 1 John 5, 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. 
so that you may know what is yours, not just in the days to come, but what is yours here and now. God, life believer, and if not, why not? God, Jesus, so many claim to have Jesus. They declare his name, but I humbly say I often wonder if many of them really do. The first thing John expresses in this passage and that we see is the evidence associated with those who have Jesus. John has already spoken specifically earlier in this work about these things more extensively, but here he reiterates and summarizes them. Love, namely, obedience, and victory. The evidence, first, talks of love. Verse 1, he says, everyone who believes, everyone, who believes that Jesus is the Christ, has been born of God, born to eternal life. It happens when we believe, when you believe, and everyone who loves the Father, because the reality is to know the Father, is to love the Father. Whoever loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Love is evidence. Leopards have spots, zebra have stripes, and believers have love. Love for God, love for one another, love for the world, the people that God loves. And we're not talking about pizza love or loving cute, cuddly kittens and warm, woolly mittens. We're talking about love that by its very nature demands expression. It must be expressed in tangible ways. It cannot be hidden. What love, true love that cannot be walked away from, true love that endures even when faced with obstacles and challenges. And even... When there's a price to pay or a sacrifice involved, true love is what we're talking about. That is evidence. Obedience is evidence. Verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. Remember what Jesus said is the first and greatest commandment? He didn't say the first and greatest suggestion or option. He said commandment, to love the Lord your God. This is it. The first and greatest commandment, according to Jesus, who always tells us the truth, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. He said pretty much, this is me paraphrasing, every, paraphrasing everything else falls under those two commandments. Commandments. It's all about love. If you love God, you will love others. You will obey his commandments. Jesus told his disciples when there are a lot of people declaring their love for him, he said, this is, you want to know how you know people are legit, how they really truly have saving faith? You want to know who it is who really loves me? It's him who obeys me. Verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep. Not that we merely consider, not that we are merely aware of. A lot of people know about the commandments of God, but this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. I remember sharing the gospel with someone at Starbucks. Listen, if you ever see me in Starbucks, pray, all right? So many people, a part of our church, have come to saving faith in Starbucks. I mean, I'm telling you, it's a special place for me. Not everybody who I talk to, um, there's, you know, but a lot of good things happen there. It's a special place. This specific opportunity, I was speaking to a husband and wife, sharing the gospel with them. The wife called upon the name of the Lord. The husband said he wasn't ready. He acknowledged that he felt like the gospel at, he, was truth, but he was not willing to respond at first. He eventually did, but at first he was struggling. I asked him what was holding him back, what was in his way. He said, well, I just don't know if I'm ready for all the rules. I don't know if I'll be able to keep all the rules. It was clear to me, though, that he wasn't being rebellious or stubborn. I was discerning that he was being genuine, feeling that he had a heart to follow all the rules, but that it was beyond his ability to do so, that he would not be able to commit to that which he wanted desperately to commit to. Picture Jeff Sereca and his son Carter walking up that hill carrying rocks. I mean, that's what religion does, places rocks on people, makes people bear burdens and rules that they need not bear. Jesus came to confront that idea during his earthly ministry. I mean, he was flipping over tables in the temple. He was not okay with that. Rules and regulations for the sake of rules and regulations, making people jump through hoops, being gatekeepers, controlling them, condemning them. Jesus said in light of that reality in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, burdened down, and I will give you rest. 
He said, take my yoke upon you. Take off that yoke that everyone else is trying to put on you, that you put on yourself. Let me help you take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am not like them. I am gentle and lowly in spirit. And if you come to me, you will find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In all honesty, I'll let you know there is a burden. But I will tell you, it is a blessed burden. It is a burden that I, who experienced this burden, would not trade for the world. I'm thankful for this burden. The truth is there are commandments, but when you know him, when you know the Father, when you know Jesus and the Spirit, you love them and you realize how much he loves you and how he is for you. You realize that each and every one of his commandments are for you, for your good, for your benefit. And second of all, you realize that he doesn't give you a commandment and then leave you hanging. He equips you, us. He gives us what we need to be and do what he's calling us to do. He is so faithful Not limited to, but including love. He gives us what we need. Therefore, his commandments are not burdensome. And I find that the things he commands us to do, in my experience, are things that I get to do. I get, and I'm so blessed when I get to gather with my brothers and sisters and remember the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. It fills my heart with gratitude. I'm so thankful that we've been commanded to do that. I'm so thankful. And it blesses my socks off when I see people take a step of obedience and profess and declare their faith through baptism. I'm telling you, anyone here who has been baptized, did you get to get baptized or were you burdened to get baptized? Just raise your hand as as you get to do it. Anybody? You get to get baptized. You get to declare your saving faith. It fills you up in church when we watch that. When we see that God has worked in someone's life, it fills us up. It's encouraging all around, and it pleases the heart of God. It is my blessing to serve my God. I I wish I could do more. It's my blessing to worship him. It's my blessing to gather and assemble with my brothers and sisters to sing to him, to love others, to pour myself out. You know what I've experienced and what I see? When people pour themselves out for the Lord, he fills them up. Rivers of living water flow from them. Living water, life. Love is evidence. Obedience is evidence. And victory. Victory is evidence. Verse 4, for everyone who has been born of God, and everyone means everyone, overcomes the world. Those who have Jesus have eternal life. They are not meant to live frustrated lives or fearful lives or discouraged lives or empty lives or angry lives, but rather victorious lives. Believers are not to settle. They are not to give up. They are not to give in. They overcome the world for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. That is our faith in Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who is mighty to save and who is strong to redeem, who is in us and greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. This is the victory, our faith in Jesus, our provider, our sustainer, who is the friend that sticks closer than a brother, that who will never, no, never, ever leave us or forsake us, the one to whom all authority in heaven on earth has been given and who will be with us even to the end of the age. Our faith is in the light of the world. Our faith is in the way, the truth, and the life. Our faith is in the one to whom every knee shall bow and every tongue confess his lordship to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is Lord. No, dear brothers and sisters, therefore we need not fear. No, dear brothers and sisters, we need not be frustrated because perfect love casts out fear. We need not be discouraged regardless of our circumstances or situation for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Verse 5, for who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Love is evidence, obedience is evidence, and victory is evidence. And think not that what is meant here means an experience of ease or of comfort or prosperity. 
Think not that our faith means that our experience will only be roses and rainbows because we are promised just by the opposite by Jesus himself in John 16, 33, where he says, in this world, you will have tribulation. But right after that, Jesus says, but take heart. Be encouraged. Don't be discouraged. Be encouraged. You will have tribulation. It's not a matter of if or when or if. It's when. You will have tribulation. But take heart for I have overcome the world. Be encouraged because I, the one in whom you place your faith and trust in, I have overcome the world. In Jesus, brothers and sisters, in him we overcome. We have victory. He said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed in John 8, 32. And Paul declared in Romans chapter 8, this passage has wrecked me this week. He said, if God be for us, who can be against us? He, God, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with Jesus give us graciously all things? Who can bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who has died and who was raised, who is at the right hand of God and who indeed is interceding for us believers. Who then, in light of that reality, shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress? Shall persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. For I, Paul, declare that all these things and in all these things, we who believe are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And he went on to say in verse 30, 38, for I am sure. I mean, I have no doubt in my mind. I am absolutely persuaded. I am confident and sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor death nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Victory. Love, obedience, and victory are evidences of saving faith. Next in this passage, we see the testimonies that affirm that faith, our faith, and specifically the object of our faith, Jesus Christ, the testimonies of water and of blood and of the Spirit. Verse 6, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testifies, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree. There's so much in these verses that we don't have time today to address. And I acknowledge to you the reality is there's much debate as to what specifically is referred to as the water and the blood that John refers to here. I'll tell you in a moment what I believe they are. But the thing that is clear what I see is I hear John speaking, writing this to the people that he loved. Is that what he was referring to did not need clarification or explanation to them. Those he was writing to, his initial audience, those frustrated believers, as such, John pro boldly presented and reminded them of the water and the blood and furthermore the Spirit, all as testifying, all as affirming the identity of Jesus Christ as the, as the Son of God, the one God sent to save. All three agree, he's saying, all three testify. These are very valid testimonies. All three affirm. As I was meditating on all this, this week, I was reminded of my experience growing up. There was, as many of you know, in my family, three boys. I have a twin brother and then another brother who's only 18 months younger. So as you might imagine, close in age, we were quite a handful to say the least. My parents are here. Amen? <laughs> well, as it relates, I believe, to John's strategy here in 1 John 5. Some of you may or may not know that my dad was a special agent. How cool is that? A special investigator. That was his career, a detective, and he was a really good one at that. Which meant that when he was around, we didn't get away with anything. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. <laughs> 
I remember literally thinking when I was a little boy that pretty much he had supernatural powers. I remember being amazed at times thinking, how could he tell that I was lying? I mean, it was almost like magic, even though I had looked in the mirror and tried to prepare myself and and try to, you know, get myself together. It was like he was psychic and could read my mind. Little did I know at the time that there are many physiological factors, for instance, like body language. When you look in a certain direction, if we would have had Google at the time, I would have been Googling all those things and looking them up. When you say certain things that point to whether you're being honest or dishonest, that my dad as a good detective knew like the back of his hand. And when something happened, when something went down, we won't get into all that went down. (laughs) Let's just say it's by the grace that we're alive today. Anyway, my dad would send the three of us to our separate rooms and then give each of us an opportunity to testify, to give our account, our recollection of what went down. And then my dad, as a good investigator would do, would consider the evidence and he would consider specifically the three testimonies, each of our three testimonies. And it was a problem if all three did not agree. And he would come to a conclusion and reach a verdict. Guys, he was right every, every time. I don't remember getting away with a thing, not one thing. Well, that is when my dad wasn't, or was around, because when he was away and it was just my mom, it was a different story. <laughs> the thing is, all this evidence that John presents reminds believers to sufficiently affirm our faith to validate our faith. And I personally understand, along with many, that the water and the blood that he's talking about, John's claiming to testify, specifically refer to the baptism and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And by doing that, he's pointing to the beginning and the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. And he declares here, first, the water testifies. In Matthew 3.16, we're told that when Jesus was baptized, this is the inauguration of his earthly ministry, the official beginning of his three-year ministry, he immediately went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened up to him and he saw the spirit descending like a dove and coming to rest on Jesus. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Any ambiguity there? Any confusion? Any, I mean, it's clear to me. John the Baptist testified. It was clear to John the Baptist. He testified in John 1 32 that the water testified when he declared, I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on Jesus. I saw it with my own eyes. I can almost see John the Baptist putting his hand over his heart and raising his right hand. I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on Jesus. And I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water, God said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I, John the Baptist, have seen and I bear witness, I testify that Jesus is the Son of God. So help me, God. Jesus' baptism is when his earthly ministry began. The water testifies and the blood testifies. Referring to the blood that Jesus shed on the cross, the blood that we remember this morning as we took communion and partook, we remember that blood that was shed to pay the price for our sins, the wages of our sins, because without, we are told in Hebrews, the the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The blood, his blood testifies. Jesus carried his own cross. Jesus, they drove nails into his feet and hands. They placed a crown of thorns upon his head. They mocked him. They spat on him. They pierced his side. He bled and he died for us. And as Jesus was breathing his last, just before he died, he declared, it is finished. They're declaring that what God had sent him to do, he did And when that happened, we are told by eyewitness accounts that there was darkness all over the land. When Jesus died, we are told the curtain was torn from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split. And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 54, the centurion, not the Christian, not the follower of Jesus, but the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus as he was nailed to the cross, watching that blood flow down his body. They saw the earthquake, they saw what took place, and they were filled with all and they said truly this was the son of God they were convinced 
The blood testifies, the water testifies, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God that indwells the hearts of those who believe testifies. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you first believed? Because the Spirit testifies. Jesus promised in John 15, 26, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, not the Spirit of lies or deceit, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. He will testify of me. The Spirit testifies. There are three that testify. And just like in my house when I was growing up, it was definitely to our benefit when all three testimonies agree. No confusion, no ambiguity. Consider the testimonies about Jesus, the object of our faith. The Spirit, verse 8, the water and the blood, these three agree. No contradiction, all affirm and confirm the truth. And then John reasons in verse 9, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. And just in case you forgot, this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his son. God has spoken. His word has been given, and it all points to Jesus. From Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through to the end of Revelation, it all points to Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. This is the testimony of God. You can't miss it. Verse 10, whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. The Holy Spirit within us does back flips and says, yes, Jesus is the son of God. Whoever does not believe God, we are told has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. Let those words sink in for a moment. Not believing God is essentially calling him a liar, according to John the apostle. So consider the evidence, consider the testimonies, and consider the verdict. Because it all comes down to the verdict. It all boils down to this believer or perhaps non-believer. Be not confused and understand verse 11. This is the testimony. God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. And whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So how about it? 